in the week and it was a wonderful talk but we didn't record that one so I'm ever so glad we're going to get this one recorded John thank you and um, Ted is a, a man with many many talents he was a professional musician played at the London Palladium is that right and yes. played to so people like Cliff Richard and yes. was it Elton John was it well no I don't think Elton John no. but all sorts all of all sorts Tom of Jones. Tom Jones yeah, yeah yeah fame I don't know but they never took his autograph unfortunately no. uh, uh, Ted's also been um, the, the pastor at Nita's Head Baptist Church in the past and um, he has written um, a number of books. One of his books we have at the back of the church, if you're interested, which is about the history, especially focused with the Baptist denomination, and that's available at the end if you're interested. So, um, and at the end of the talk, Ted is going to be happy to take any questions, mm -hmm. and um, welcome, Ted. Thank you. And we just pray for you now. Thank, Thank you. you. Hello. People are impressed to hear that I played with Tom Jones and Cliff Richard. They never seem to take a scrap of notice when I say I've also played with Yehudi Menuhin and um, Daniel Barenboim and people like that. I've also played for the Queen on many occasions because I was one of her cellists in the Guards. I've often played in Buckingham Palace. And I knew the Queen was there. She didn't know I was there, though. There we are. Well, I trust you'll find the talk this afternoon helpful, challenging, instructive. I'm talking about the history of the Congregational Church. What is a Congregational Church? Why do we have Congregationalism? Where does it come from? I've got to start briefly. There's so much I could say, and I, I can't say everything. It'll take far too long. Everything about the Christian church always starts in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago with Jesus. And he founded the church, his church, and he referred to it, or the, the word used in the New Testament, the Greek word used is ecclesia. And that's when you read your Bible and you see the word church. That's the word that's there, ecclesia. And it's not a good translation. and should never be translated as church. And the very first translation of the New Testament from the original language into English by William Tyndale in 1526, you read congregation, the congregation. Because church is a fairly vague word and it puts the emphasis on or buildings or organisations or anything. Congregation puts the emphasis on the people, the family that comes together in the name of Jesus to worship and learn and help in the world. And that was Jesus' idea. And the congregation was answerable directly to him. Each member of a congregation, if you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit lives in you and you have direct access to God without the need of any other intermediary. So you are, in other words, a priest. Every member of a congregational church is a priest. You don't divide up into priesthood and laity. That's Old Testament. Perfectly valid then, but Jesus changed it. And the congregational church, the ministers, the leaders, the elders, whatever you like to call them, they ran the church in conjunction with the members. You all got together and you decided where you were going and how you were going to run things. And very soon after Jesus had gone back and after the apostles probably had died out, very soon things began to change and in the bigger cities the churches there planted out other churches and instead of allowing them to be independent congregations they said you belong to us we'll tell you and you over there and that church over there what to do 
and the leaders of the big churches in the cities, the prominent churches, took the title of bishop. And bishop is just the title of any church leader. It simply means overseer or superintendent. That's what a bishop is, episkopos, overseer. Exactly the same as being an elder or being a pastor. And if you know your New Testament well, and if you know the Acts of the Apostles and Paul's letters and Peter's letters, you know that the words pastor and elder and bishop are used interchangeably. But the, whatever the rights or wrongs, the Christian church, as it spread throughout the world, divided these things up and it became a control organisation. It even became national and governments had a say. Governments could say what a church should do and what it shouldn't do. Jesus said, my kingdom is not a kingdom of this world. There should never be a state church. It's wrong. And congregationists have always believed that, and so have many other Christians. Jesus said, my father is looking for those who will worship him and spirit in spirit and truth. Jesus wants us to come voluntarily and serve him and worship him. Governments began to tell people, you've got to go to church and you'll be fined if you don't go. This is terrible stuff, really, but it's the history of the church. And God uses it. He's gracious and he uses our imperfections. None of us get it completely right. He uses our muddles uh, to glorify himself and to save people. So I'm going to jump from the New Testament church right through to the 1500s. There were movements to try and change things. They weren't very successful. They ended up with people being imprisoned and punished. But we come to the 1500s and a new move starts that we call the Reformation. And... In spite of all the problems, it did grow and became planted firmly around the world and people that opposed it and didn't like it weren't able to stop it. So the Reformation comes to England in the 1500s and the king, as you all know, is Henry VIII, a very, very clever man, one doesn't doubt that, but quite a nasty character. And the changes he made in the church were purely for his own political and family benefits. He wasn't interested in what the Bible said. And he did some terrible things, as we know. But there were people around him in his court. People like Thomas Cranmer, Thomas Cromwell, Anne Boleyn, uh, who were thinking about these things and thinking, yes, there's got to be change. How are we going to do it? And one man who's interesting comes from this city, our city, Norwich. Uh, A man called Matthew Parker. I don't know if you know the name, Matthew Parker. If you go just down Magdalen Street, by the flyover, there's a big church there, no longer used for public worship, uh, St. Saviour's Church. And Matthew Parker was christened as a baby there, around about 1500, I think, I'm not quite certain. And he became an ordained priest in the Roman Catholic Church, obviously. And he was the private chaplain to Queen Anne Boleyn. And he and she discussed Luther's ideas and read the Bible together. And when she knew that she was going to be executed, she said to Parker, can you look after my baby daughter? Or she was grown up six or seven by then, I think, Elizabeth. Keep her on this path. Don't let her go back into the old Roman ways. And Parker did so. And years later, when Elizabeth became Queen Elizabeth, she appointed Matthew Parker as her Archbishop of Canterbury. So here's a big name from Norwich. And just over on the corner of the road there, that church, uh, St. Clement's, You can go and there's something on there today as part of the Heritage Weekend. And if you go in round the back there, you'll see the tomb of Matthew Parker's mother and father there to this day. Now, Parker, uh, things happened, but they, they didn't go very far. And we come after Henry's death to his young son, Edward VI, 
and Cranmer and others then had a lot more freedom and they drew up the Book of Common Prayer, which some of you may still use, I don't know, in some parish churches sometimes, in services. The Book of Common Prayer is still used. It's not the original that's used, it's a 1662 version. Uh, it dates from 1549, the original, and there were one or two revisions before 1662. And there was also the 39 articles of the Church of England drawn up by Cranmer during Edward's reign. It wasn't originally 39, numbers have changed over the years. And then there was the Act of Uniformity. Here's a problem. The government said everybody has got to agree with the Book of Common Prayer, got to agree with the articles, they've got to do as we tell them. And there were some people who didn't like that. There was one man in particular, John Hooper, Bishop of Gloucester. And he said, the church needs to be purified in accordance with the Bible. And that is, as far as we know, the first use in that sense of the word Puritan. And John Hooper is considered to be the father of the Puritans. I don't know if he dressed like John. Wouldn't surprise me. Perhaps he did. But one thing he did, did happen to him. I hope it never happens to John. He was burned alive when Mary Tudor became queen. And Mary wanted to take things back to the pre-Reformation. Um, the big thing was the mass had to be celebrated. Um, but she died after a short while, about six, seven years. Then Elizabeth became queen, and things began to change then. Two things began to change. Uh, men, vicars, rectors, curates, all these men in the church, because there was only the Church of England then, men began to say, well, I don't know, I'm not going to do what the Book of Common Prayer says. Why should I? I've got the Bible, and I'm going to get my congregation together, and we'll discuss how are we going to run our church. It was illegal to do that, and they had to keep quiet about it and do it quietly, discreetly. They became known as independents. That's the name we give to them looking back. And there were other men who went even further than that and came out of their churches, even if they kept their Sunday services going, perhaps in the Sunday morning, but they would meet separately. That's why they were called separatists. Quietly, somewhere in the afternoon, and they would have a totally separate sort of service. There was a man called Richard Fitz in 1560. It's only a couple of years after she became queen. And he was operating some kind of clandestine church near St. Paul's Cathedral in London. And um, there were a group of men running con independent congregations in huge warehouses down by the River Thames. This great big complex of warehouses called the Steel Yard. It was all to do with the Hanseatic League of Merchants. And you get these huge complex of buildings so people can go in and out. The big city like London is where um, Cannon Street Station is today, so I'm told. And you can go in discreetly and people will be told, uh, when you come on Sunday, don't all come together like you see people walking down the road going to church. Come separately, come very early, some of you. Come a bit later, others. You come in the front way, you come around the back. Come in your working clothes. Bring a bag of tools with you. People think you're going to work. It never occurred to them you're going to have a church service. Don't sit. They never sang. They didn't sing hymns because they didn't want anyone to hear them. And this sort of thing was happening. And where people were found and reported, in some cases they were thrown into prison. And prison was a pretty unpleasant place in those days. And you easily became diseased and ill and sick and died. And quite a lot of the men doing this did die in prison. One or two were actually hung for doing it. And these are the men that we now talk of as congregationalists. Uh, the word wasn't used then, not for a long time, but I'm going to refer to them as congregationalists because that's the way we think of them. And that's what I'm talking about, these people. But there were another group of men also, during Mary Tudor's reign, a lot of men went off 
to Holland and Germany and especially to Geneva to avoid persecution in England to be able to worship freely. And in Geneva they came under the influence of the great French theologian John Calvin and he taught a different form of church structure. Um, The elders, he said, the word elder as you probably know is presbyter, it's simply a Greek word meaning a mature man, Um, and in spiritual terms you were expected to be a mature Christian couldn't be a a novice you'd have to know a bit about the christian faith and they would be the leaders and calvin said each church should have a number of elders they will appoint the minister and then the minister and the elders together will run the church not the minister in the congregation congregation let's say the whole congregation presbyterians say the elders with the minister And also, ideally, the Presbyterian Church should be a national church and the government should implement whatever rules the Presbyterian Church makes. Uh, That's Presbyterianism. And when these men returned after Mary's death, the Scottish element, John Knox and other people, were able to get this Presbyterian set up Um, arranged in Scotland and as we know Scotland was a Presbyterian nation and the Church of Scotland is Presbyterian to this day never and so are other places South Africa and parts of America and Holland Presbyterianism there's never been Presbyterianism like that in England ever uh, because in England it didn't catch on in spite of every attempt by some people to do that but it didn't catch on, and so there were independent churches where the vicar or rector would say, I'm going to appoint elders, and we're going to run this church. So it would be a Presbyterian in that sense, but it would have no structure nationally, no meetings with other local Presbyterian churches. Um, So here you've got these two groups, independent, but some of them ruling through the elders, others through the whole congregation. And this is very interesting, because it was all new, you see. Nobody had done this before. We look back on it and talk about it. I'm here talking about it. In those days, it was brand new. No one knew really what was going to happen, what was coming. And what did men really expect when they were trying to reform the church? What did they really have in mind? How did they understand the scriptures And something very interesting happened in our city, again here. Um, In 1580, 175 men signed a petition to the Queen asking her to abolish the Episcopal system and to reorganise the Church of England along Presbyterian lines. Now that's important. These men said they wanted Presbyterianism. But there are two names that stand out for anyone that knows the Christian history of this city, Robert Brown and John Harrison. I don't know if any of you heard of them. Robert Brown was the chaplain of St. Helens in Bishopgate, which is open today, and you'll be able to go and look around there if you haven't already been. Um, That's the chapel of the Great Hospital, and Brown was the chaplain. It's also the parish church for the area. It was then, still is now. And Harrison was the warden of the great hospital. And these two men, in fact, were running St. Helens as a congregational church. They would meet with the congregation and say, now, are we going to keep to the prayer book or not? Am I going to wear these robes on Sunday? What what are we going to do? How are we going to handle this? So here were congregationalists who were signing a petition about Presbyterianism. It shows a sort of crossover and muddle and uncertainty. Harry uh, Brown was um, not as subtle as all the other congregationalists who met in secret or kept quiet. He was quite in your face. And he was running the church here, as I say, as a congregational church, and he was travelling around other churches in East Anglia, talking to other ministers, vicars, rectors and people, trying to encourage them or advise them if they were thinking already in those terms. Let's, let's do this. And so it didn't last long. He was quickly arrested and thrown into prison. And Harrison and quite a few members of St. Helens then went off to the continent, went to Middleburg in Holland. And Harrison joined, uh, Brown joined them when he came out of prison. 
but um, he published a book in Holland within a year or so of going there, within less than that, a few months. So I like to think that he actually thought up the contents here in St. Helens. And this book was called Reformation Without Tarrying for Any. You've got to get on and do it. We don't wait. Don't wait till the government says we can. Just, if you feel that way, do it. And this book explained, or he made a big case, if you're a magistrate, a ruler of some kind, a civic dignitary of some kind, lawyer, and you're a Christian, then you should be a member of the church, in which case you're part of it. You submit with the whole congregation. You work together. So how come you think you've got the right to tell the congregation you can't do this? It's against the law. I'm going to fine you for doing it. He said, it's nonsense. It doesn't work. Government, rulers, the legal profession should have no say over the church at all. Um, and this was quite a controversial book. And people were actually executed for being caught with copies or selling them in this country. No one's ever quite certain how Brown got away with it. Because he lived for another 50 years. He was only about 30 when he published this book. He lived till he was 80. And he had another 25 or so imprisonments during that time. But he was never executed. Nobody knows why. In the early days, in the Elizabethan period, up to the end of the century, he was saved quite often by Lord Burley, William Cecil, who was Queen Elizabeth's chief minister, as you possibly know, the most important man in England. And he was related to Brown. He seems to have got him off the hook more than once. But what happened after Burley's death, the next 20 or 30 years, no one seems to know how Brown got away with it, in and out of prison. But there it is. Now, um, this, this uh, was happening. And yes, oh yes, one point I must make, because this is the 400th anniversary of Shakespeare's birth. And Brown is mentioned in one of Shakespeare's plays. Because what happened all over England as this movement was developing, people were referring to Congregationalists as Brownists. It caused quite a lot of offence. Uh, some men said, we're not Brownists, we're followers of Jesus. Not Brown? Why bring him into it? But if you read as I'm sure you all do, you're Shakespeare, of course you do. Twelfth Night, Act 3, Scene 2, where Andrew Algachik is trying to win the attention of his lady love, and he's not getting very far. Someone says to him, listen, you're going to have to use either valour or politics. And Sir Andrew replies, well, it's going to have to be valour, I'd just as soon be a Brownist as a politician. And people roar with laughter in the Globe Theatre, I expect. Nice one, Bill. They wouldn't have known who Brown was, necessarily. They wouldn't have known he came from Norwich. But they all knew what a Brownist was. And Shakespeare might not have known exactly the details about Brown, but he would have known, because everybody knew what a Brown... It's like talking about a... A Marxist, and people who talk about Marxists don't necessarily know where and where Marx lived and what he did. It's just a name associated with that. And this was the same with Brownism. So Brown made his place in history. So we just got to look now at Norwich in the late Tudor and the Stuart times. And we've got... Um, a man called, oh, I've got, no wonder I couldn't do it, sorry, I've got my notes in the wrong place. A man called William, oh, sorry, with you in a minute, William Bridge. St. Peter Hungate, just up the road there. And William Bridge was the minister of St. Peter Hungate. And he was suspended in, nine, in uh, 1637 because he refused to read the book of sports. And there's a plaque telling us about it there. And I think there's an article somewhere out there on the table about the book of sports. 
We needn't go into what it was. It was a, it was a book uh, published with the authority of the church, encouraging people to get out and play sports on a Sunday um, and not to spend all day in church with these Puritan ministers. In a sense, I've got some sympathy with the book because people worked six full days a week very hard and Sunday was the only time for a bit of healthy exercise. Uh, and the church said you shouldn't do anything on a Sunday other than come to church. And Bridge certainly wouldn't read the book to his congregation. So he was sacked uh, from his job. And he went off to uh, Rotterdam to lead an English congregation there. He came back pretty quickly. And he ministered at St. Peter Hungate and Yarmouth Parish Church. And he had to go off again. And he was in trouble with the authorities. Yarmouth was a good place to be because there's always, you can always find a boat there to get away quick. And that's what he had to do on one occasion. But then, of course, uh, he came back and he was running uh, an independent congregational type church with Timothy Armitage, who was the minister of St. Michael's Costlany down the road here, what was the Science Museum. I don't know what is there now. But you'll see the name up on the board where the minister, or down the here, isn't it? That he, Bridge, and um, he were the second ministers of the church that eventually came here. It wasn't here in their day, um, it was somewhere else where they met. And then the Civil War came along. And this was a huge benefit to Congregationalists and all sorts of independent people because you can't enforce the law during the war as easily as you can in peacetime and the parliamentary side tended to be more independent minded the Puritans, all those sort of people and so Cromwell and the parliamentarians wanted all the cooperation they could get from the congregationalists and those sort of people so um, they had a free, a free free time there were lots and lots of sects and cults that started up during the civil war uh, you only read the names nowadays, seekers, diggers, ranters, muggletonians, uh, levellers, fifth monarchy men. The one group that did start up that is with us to this day, of course, Quakers. And the Quakers, whatever, they're a bit vague nowadays, I think. I've got Quaker friends and they don't even profess to believe the Bible or Christian teaching. But... In their day when they started, they were very remarkable people and one has to admire them. And they had an amazing impact upon this nation, far, far bigger than their numbers, uh, especially in the Industrial Revolution. But the, the people from the, that were going to be the Congregationalists and start the old meeting, in uh, 1643, they were meeting in the grain store at the back of... Blackfriars Hall. If you go up Duke Street and turn it through the archway by the Art College and go round the back there, you'll see the old grain store. There's a big plaque on the wall saying that the Baptists were there in um, 1689, which they were, but originally the Independents were there. Now, I don't know where they went after that. They didn't stay long because by 1685, the Roman Catholics were using it. And as I say, by 1689, the Baptists were. And in 1693, they were able to, the Congregationalists, to have their own building. And this is it. We're in it. First independent chapel to be built in Norwich. And possibly one of the first, if not the first, anywhere in England. Because the Toleration Act had been passed. And so you could come out into the open and say, I'm not Church of England, I'm a Congregationalist. And no one was going to punish you for saying it any longer. There were all sorts of disabilities. Because in 1662, the Act of Uniformity was repeated. And you had to conform and you had to swear that you believed in the prayer book 39 articles and you were going to be totally obedient to the Church of England and those men that couldn't do that were thrown out about 2,000 men left the Church of England ministers 
on that particular day in August 1662. And then the act of, um, I forget what it was called, uh, there was an act that restricted what positions you could hold in society. You had to be a respectable communicant member of the Church of England to be a member of Parliament or to be a magistrate or to hold any government position, an ambassador, anything like that. You, had to, you couldn't be a mayor unless you were a mayor. You could be a, 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 a councillor and even an alderman, but you couldn't ever be mayor or sheriff or town clerk unless you were a communicant member. You couldn't send your son to university and you couldn't hold a commission in the army or the navy. And an awful lot of people who didn't agree with the Church of England said they did and made the vows and stayed because they didn't want to have all these disabilities against them. So it was, it was like an Islamic country today. In, in Islamic countries they have what is called dimitude. And a Muslim is a first-class citizen a Jew or a Christian is a second-class citizen and everybody else is third-class. Well, that's what England was like in those days, first or second-class. So the Church of England became respectable. And if you wanted to be a respectable English gentleman, you were in the Church of England whether you agreed with it or not. There's an interesting incident of a man, Smith, who lived in Essex, a well-to-do Englishman, very respectable always seen in his parish church when he was there in residence. But he was the MP for Norwich. And when he was in Norwich, and he spent as much time as he could in Norwich, he was never seen in the parish church. He was in the Octagon Chapel, although that building itself, yes, that was there by Smith's day, because he was late 18th, early 19th century. So he would have been in that building there because he was a Unitarian. He was a Presbyterian, but they changed to Unitarianism by that time. And he was the man. It was illegal to say you were Unitarian in the 18th century. Unitarian is someone who doesn't believe in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They say, no, there's just God. And Jesus was an ordinary man. Remarkable man, maybe, but he wasn't God in human form. So in other words, there's no atonement made through his death, no salvation. But anyway... Um, some men and women from all denominations, backgrounds, would go to their parish church once or twice a year, some congregationalists did it, and you would make sure everyone saw you take communion and you would even get a check signed by the church wardens. This man was here and he took communion. So you're a good Anglican, even though you never went in the rest of the year, you were congregational or Baptist or something. Quakers never, ever did that. They were the only denomination, as far as we know, where no Quaker would do that. They stuck to their guns. But other people did give way sometimes and just pretend. But it was from 1662 that English nonconformity really starts. You've got the Church of England, respectable, and everyone else not quite with it, not quite proper church. But... During the Civil War period, before this had happened, things were changing a lot, as I said, and they, you couldn't enforce the law. And one of the things that happened during the Civil War period was the government tried to impose Presbyterianism on Norwich. Um, I don't know if you live in Dussingdale or if you know Dussingdale at all, but up on Dussingdale there's a little close called Lentor Close. And Lentil was the Speaker of the House of Commons. And he sent a letter to the Norwich Council saying you've got to reorganise all your parishes into presbyteries. And a list is made, I won't bother to read them, of all the parish churches to be grouped together. And the council said, yes, sir, but didn't do a thing about it. And that's what happened in the rest of England, and no one took a scrap of notice. And after that... Um, there was an election and most of the Presbyterian MPs lost their seats. And from the 1660s onwards, Parliament was very strongly Episcopal in favour of the Church of England as a set-up, as it is now. 
and Presbyterian never again had any chance of taking on in England. And if we move into the 18th century, not a lot of growth in congregationalism. Um, the big thing, of course, in the 18th century was Methodism and the Wesley brothers and George Whitfield, and they built the tabernacle down in Bishopgate. And Whit most of Whitfield's followers drifted away into congregationalism, it appears. Wesley's never did. They founded the Methodist Church. And in um, 1817, there was a young man called to the tabernacle as minister, but he never did take on the, for some reason. And a lot of members left the tabernacle and said to him, we're going to form a new church for you to be our minister, a congregational church. And they did that, and that became Prince's Street Congregational Church. Some of you know it. Perhaps you've been in there this weekend or will be. Uh, and that was a very big, important Presbyter uh, congregational church for many years in this city. And it, it, um, Alexander himself ministered there right through until 1866, the only place he ever ministered in, in his life. Later on, in 1858, there was a big congregational church erected in Chapelfields. Um, if you go up Theatre Street, and when you get past the theatre, turn left as if you're going to go round and into the back car park at the back of the theatre. And that road going round to the left, that's where this huge church was, facing across the chapel fields. And there's a photo of it down there, if any of you want to see it. It closed in 1966 and was demolished a few years afterwards. And the congregation merged with Jessup Road Congregational Church, which is just out the direction of the university there. Um, then there was the Magdalen Road Congregational Church, and that was founded in 1893 as an offshoot of Prince's Street. And the building was actually opened in 1897, and it was destroyed in the Second World War. There were a number of churches of all denominations in 1942 in a series of two or three raids. And there was St Mary's the Baptist, what is now Central Baptist, and the one down um, down the end, St Benedict's, there's only the tower left. Down there, there was St Paul's Church. There was a huge, beautiful church at the top of Thorn Lane, opposite where... Um, the big store is now uh, the back of the EDP offices and car park. Lovely church there. St. Michael at Thorne, that was destroyed. St. Julian's, Mother Julian's, St. Julian's Church. Quite a lot, just within the space of two or three nights, around about July 1942. So that was the story. There was a Presbyterian church built in Norwich in the 1860s. Suddenly, after all these years, Presbyterianism came back. And this was by a group of Scottish businessmen in the city. And it was opened in, um, I've got a date here somewhere, opened in 1875. And there's a photo of it down here. And that was at Theatre Street as well, just behind where the Millennium Library is now. And that was one that was destroyed in 1942 as well. And they opened a new Presbyterian church next to the Roman Catholic Cathedral, top of Grapes Hill, what is now known as Trinity. And that is now what happened then. There was an Ipswich Road Congregational Church built in 1952, and there were possibly some other smaller chapels and mission halls for the congregationals. But it was beginning, the power of congregationalism in the community was beginning to weaken and they were becoming more liberal in many ways, less Bible-believing, and the more evangelical elements were beginning to move more and more into the modern churches, house churches, all that sort of thing. Um, and in 1972, congregational churches in this city, all of them, with the exception of this one, merged with Trinity, evangelical, uh, Trinity uh, Presbyterian Church at the top of Grapes Hill to become the United Reform Church. And all over England, congregational churches joined up 
with the few Presbyterian churches that there were to become United Reformed Church. There were, it's estimated there were 1,700 congregational churches in England and 1,400 of them joined with the Presbyterians. 300 remained independent, including this one. And there is a congregational federation. There's also an evangelical fellowship of congregational churches. And some just remain totally independent. So this is why we've still got some congregational churches. There's one in North Walsham. There's one in Deerham. And John could tell you afterwards if you ask him where the others are scattered around. So congregationalism isn't a big, powerful force as it once was in this city or in the land. Power now has passed over really to lots of independent churches like King's Church down King Street and Soul Church up on the estate and various other churches, what they're called charismatic and house churches and some of these churches now run into many hundreds or even thousands of people on a Sunday. My daughter goes to a church where there's about a thousand people on a Sunday morning, about five or six hundred on a Sunday evening, just up on the industrial estate to the edge of the city. Mainly young people. I say with hair my colour, they won't let me in. That's not strictly speaking true because there are people of all ages there. Um, and some of the worship is very loud. Uh, not the sort of thing that you necessarily like. But God is using it all. All these sort of things are happening and the church is always, when it seems to be sagging, suddenly revives and becomes new and something new happens. That's the wonderful thing. So that's the situation of what a congregational church is. The name congregationalism started about 1640 from a church in London. A man called Henry Jacobs said to be the man that coined the name. So it's been a bit rushed. There's a lot of information there. Any questions you would like to ask? No. Okay, well, if you want to approach me privately afterwards, you're welcome to do so. And I'll answer if I can. So thank you for listening so well. Hope you found it interesting, challenging, stimulating. God bless you all.